Welcome everybody to this lecture presented by the Historic Towns Trust in association with the University of Bristol. It's a great pleasure to welcome so many of you here this evening. I just wish we could have met in person, but perhaps it's, more, it's possible for more of you to join us as we're doing it online. Can I please remind you to keep your microphones muted during the talk? Uh, and please feel free to turn off your cameras as well. You don't need to have those on. It's probably easiest if you put your questions into the chat and then I can um, pass the questions on to Vanessa at the end of her talk. So microphones off, cameras off if you prefer, and questions in the chat line if you wouldn't mind. So it's my great pleasure to introduce Professor Vanessa Harding to give our lecture this evening. Um, Vanessa is very well known as a historian of medieval and early modern London. She's Professor of London History at Birkbeck University of London. And she's also a trustee and honorary secretary of the British Historic Towns Trust. Her research and writing focus on the social history of early modern London from about 1500 to 1700, um, especially on the family and the household, on the environment, health and disease, death and burial. She contributed to the Historic Towns Trust maps of medieval London and London 1520, and she's currently developing a new project to map London on the eve of the Great Fire. So she's talking to us today about early Tudor London, a city on the brink of transformation. Thank you very much, Vanessa, please go ahead. Thank you very much, Helen, for that introduction and thank you all for joining us this afternoon. Uh, in this talk, I'm going to be exploring the Historic Towns Trust map of London around 1520. And what I want to do is to discuss what London was like in 1520 and how it had evolved since around 1270 to 1300, which is the date of the Historic Towns Trust medieval London map. So I'll say a bit about the 1520, I'll, I'll discuss London in 1520, I'll say a bit about the 1520 map as an artifact and how it came to be made. And finally, uh, about the changes that swept over London in the century or so after the date of our early, of our early Tudor map and the possibilities of creating a new map to display these developments. In, let me just do this. In 1520, London was by far the largest city in Britain and one of the largest in Western Europe. And its development over the centuries had been significantly shaped by, the, by its proximity to the center of royal government in Westminster and it was also the location of the country's largest royal fortress, prison, armory and arsenal. But it was also a vibrant commercial hub with a confident civic government exercising a good deal of authority and influence. Though many features, many of its features had evolved over time, in physical form, early Tudor London still had much in common with the London of around 1270-1300. Many of its most prominent physical features were already centuries old. So the line and much of the, uh, and much of the structure of the walls dated back to the Roman period. The main street lines of the city had been laid down well before the Norman conquest. The Tower of London, founded in the late 11th century, had by the beginning of the 14th century, developed into the massive concentric fortress we now know. St Paul's Cathedral, founded in the 7th century, had been rebuilt and extended to its medieval maximum before 1300. Many of the city's 100 plus parish churches were established by 1100 and most of the rest by 1200. Most of the religious houses were founded by 1250 and the friaries by 1300. The Stone Bridge was complete by 1250. However, despite the obvious similarities, London in 1520 had undergone many changes since 1300. And the most dramatic of these was of course the Black Death of 1348 to 50, which killed tens of thousands of Londoners among millions across Britain and Western Europe. On the eve of the pandemic, London had been a flourishing and populous city 
but possibly as many as 80,000 inhabitants, consolidating an increasingly dominant position in the nation's political and economic structures. The impact of the first epidemic was followed by further waves in the late 14th century, and by the 15th, plague was a recurrent urban phenomenon. London's population was sharply cut back, and population loss and economic change in the countryside stemmed the flow of migrants on which all medieval cities depended for recovery and growth. At the time of the national poll tax in 1377 to 81, that is 30 years after the first epidemic, it appears that the total population of the city, Southwark and Westminster was between 45 and 50,000. While we have no population data till the mid 16th century, it seems likely that London's population total stagnated or even declined further for the next century. Evidence from the property market shows falling property values, mounting rent arrears, and the decay and disappearance of actual buildings, even in prime locations such as Cheapside. The labour market too suggests little population pressure. Real wages reached their highest in the second half of the 15th century, and there seem to have been more employment opportunities for non-citizen workers, including women and girls. By the early 16th century, however, alongside continuing markers of decay, there are also indicators of renewed population growth, perhaps particularly on the outskirts. Building activity and rents in Southwark and Westminster were on the increase from the 1480s, and by the 1520s, a number of institutional landlords in the city itself were investing in rebuilding and refurbishing their properties in the expectation of higher demand and higher rents. There was renewed anxiety about migration, poverty and vagrancy, and prices were beginning to rise. Craft guilds and companies began to police more closely the rules restricting the activities of immigrant workers, complaining in 1494 of the influx of foreign journeymen who took their employment without acknowledging guild control. Under pressure from the Crown, the City of London lowered the barriers to obtaining citizenship in the 1520s, resulting in a major increase in the number of free men. However, although London had certainly experienced population loss and some economic difficulty in the later Middle Ages, it had done much better than most other English towns. England's urban population as a whole declined over the period, and most towns and cities were smaller in the early 16th century than they had been in 1380, let alone before the Black Death. In 1520, London was already some six or seven times the size of the next largest English city, Norwich. Its population probably equaled or exceeded that of Norwich, Bristol, York, Exeter, Coventry, Newcastle and Salisbury combined. In terms of taxable wealth too, London had increased its lead over the rest. By the 1520s, London's contribution to direct taxation was 10 times that of Norwich and equal to the combined assessment of the leading 30 provincial towns. London's relative success in the later Middle Ages at the expense of other towns and cities rested on a combination of factors, of which the pre-existing wealth of its merchants was certainly one, enabling many of them to weather difficulties that drove others under. So too were changes in patterns of overseas trade. London vintners lost out as the high medieval wine trade with Gascony was cut back by the devastating effects of plague and warfare, but London cloth merchants did spectacularly well, following the shift in the later Middle Ages to exporting cloth rather than raw wool. In 1450, about 40% of England's wool export trade passed through London and just over 40% of England's cloth exports. Between 1450 and 1550, London's cloth export rose sevenfold and its share of the national total more than doubled. The annual value of London's import trade likewise increased from around 50,000 in the 1470s to 80,000 around 1500 and perhaps 140,000 in the 1530s. Huge fortunes were being made from trade by the London merchant adventurers in particular. 10% of assessed taxpayers in 1522 owned or were assessed at over 85% of London's wealth. The top 1% indeed, fewer than 100 men, owned 50% of the city's assessed wealth. 
also important and depending to a significant extent on its wealth was London's relationship with the crown. The mid 15th century troubles of the monarchy, that is the Wars of the Roses, gave London an advantage in negotiations over finance and the city was able to significantly influence policies and outcomes. Even when things settled down with the establishment of the Tudor dynasty and regime, London's value as a source of crown finance remained. It may well have benefited from greater stability and the increased scope of Henry VII's government, which drew activity and resources to Westminster. So how much of this uh, change, decline, renewed prosperity was visible on the ground or indeed on the map of London in 1520? Now, the scale of this map fairly obviously doesn't allow us to plot individual houses, but detailed studies of smaller areas can show the patterns of decay and rebuilding. So here, for example, are sketch maps of Cheapside in 1300 and 1550. And as the comparison shows, the extreme division of land to accommodate shops and selling spaces only a few feet square, which is documented in the early 14th century, disappeared after the pandemics. By the early 16th century, even in the commercial heart of the city, there were open plots where houses had once stood. London in 1500 was less crowded, with more open space between and behind buildings. But on the other hand, as I've already mentioned, by the 1520s and 30s, private and institutional landlords were investing in rebuilding and refurbishing properties in the expectation of improved rent income and rising property values. This actually took some time to come through, but when it did, it was substantial. Medieval London's engagement in overseas trade certainly shaped uh, its waterfront, lined with wharves and jetties pushing further into the river, though commercial uses still had to compete with Londoners' other uses for the river, local transport, collecting water, laundry, the disposal of rubbish. The establishment of a royal customs house in the 1380s on a site already known as Wool Wharf, focused overseas trade on the stretch below the bridge, though ships and barges still passed through the bridge to unload at the Vintry and the Hanseatic Steelyard. The growth in cloth exports from the later 15th century doesn't seem to have had much visible impact on the facilities of the port and the nature of the trade, which mostly involved the short sea crossing to Antwerp, didn't make new demands on shipping and handling, even though volumes had increased so dramatically. Reform of the customs and of the organization of the port had to wait till the middle of the 16th century. However, there were other related developments, uh, notably the establishment of the cloth markets at Blackwell Hall next to Guildhall, dating from the late 14th century, and Leaden Hall in the late 15th century, in the 15th century. And the transport of cloth into London from the country, as well as the redistribution of imports and London manufacturers to the provinces, no doubt contributed to the development of road and river transport, pack horse trains and carting, and the inns that ringed the city, providing accommodation for travellers, including commercial travellers and their goods. Access to the court, crown and government drew provincial aristocrats, lay and ecclesiastical, to London. Early, earlier in the Middle Ages, several provincial bishops and abbots maintained townhouses in the city, Southwark, and particularly along the Strand, and the number of such houses increased in the 15th and 16th centuries, complemented by inns and lodgings for shorter term visitors, especially in Westminster. And London's concentration of skilled craftsmen, luxury trades, and exotic imports increased its attraction for the nation's upper classes and provisioning and the acquisition of goods to support an aristocratic lifestyle were important activities. While the monarch and government were firmly seated at Westminster, the separation of crown and city was not absolute. The crown maintained a wardrobe or storehouse and manufactory in the city. And apart from the tower itself, overlooking but not in the city, properties in and near the city passed in and out of royal hands in the 15th and 16th centuries. Cold Harbour, Crosby Place, the second Baynard's Castle, the short-lived Bridewell Palace. And as readers of Wolf Hall will recall, Henry VIII's minister 
Thomas Cromwell chose to reside within the walled city in the 1530s in a house close to the Austin Friars. An important development in late medieval England was the growth of the legal profession and of the volume of business at the central law courts at Westminster. This had its impact on London. From the late Middle Ages, the inns of court, located between the city and Westminster, served both as a training ground for would-be lawyers and government servants, and a finishing school for gentlemen. Gray's Inn, Lincoln's Inn, and the Temple were complemented by several inns of chancery, establishing a legal quarter to the west of the city that survives to this day. Alongside the growth of the inns of court, perhaps the most single visible difference between the London of 1270 to 1300 and that of 1520 was the appearance of dozens of livery company halls, testimony to the prosperity of the numerous craft organizations and guilds, which had developed and consolidated since the 14th century. Early medieval London certainly had a number of craft guilds, such as the weavers, the saddlers, the vintners, but what was remarkable was how these multiplied and became embedded in the city's political as well as economic structures over the 14th and 15th centuries. The guilds had many roles, including the oversight of manufacturing and trading standards, the discipline of members and devolved civic fundraising, but an important aspect of their ethic was fraternity, embodied in corporate feasts and ceremonial and collective religious observance. And for all these activities, they needed a suitable venue and an increasing number of them built themselves a dedicated livery hall, thanks to property and resources bequeathed by wealthy members. The actual location of a particular hall was determined by the property portfolio and choices of the benefactor, but since there was a tendency for occupations to cluster, it usually reflected the locus of the guild members' activity. Thus, Vintner's Hall was built in the 15th century on land in the Vintry, once owned by the 14th century Vintner, John Stody. Fishmonger's Hall was built on property near the bridge, bequeathed by wealthy fishmongers Sir John Lovekin and Sir William Walworth. The more modest Girdler's Company built their hall on the site of houses in Basing Hall Street, left to the company in 1431. The halls housed dinners and court meetings and accommodated the guild's administrative and domestic staff, as well as their archives and muniments, and an array of ceremonial plate and equipment. Not directly visible on the map, though perceptible on the streets, was the increased role of the companies as landowners and landlords of tenanted property, again usually bequeathed by wealthy members for charitable purposes. By 1520, the leading companies such as the Mercers, Drapers and Goldsmiths had extensive property portfolios, and they may already have been marking individual properties with their arms or symbols. The Mercers' Maidenhead, the Grocers' Cloves, the Goldsmiths' Lions and Salts. And this practice was more widely shared. So, for example, when the trustees of London Bridge rebuilt a property in Cheapside in 1536 to 8, the window glazing included 71 quarrels or squares of glass with the bridge house mark and the date. A more visible expression of the guild's corporate charitable identity were the almshouses, sometimes associated with their halls, as here at Grocer's Hall, sometimes standing separately. Although all of the parish churches extant in 1520 had been there 250 years earlier, many of them had benefited in the interim from later medieval Londoners' combination of wealth and piety and had been repaired, rebuilt, extended and decorated in the 15th and early 16th centuries. Notable rebuildings with known patrons, including that of St. Michael Paternoster, to incorporate a college of priests and an almshouse by Sir Richard Whittington in the early 15th century, and St Andrew Undershaft by Mayor Stephen Jennings in the 1520s, but there were many more, as well too as lesser works, including the addition of aisles, chapels, towers and cloisters. Londoners also paid for altars, tombs, windows, bells and clocks. From the middle of the 15th century, uh, we begin to have church wardens accounts that detail these projects and inventories that record the wealth of fittings and furnishings that added to the interior splendor of these parish churches. 
Material objects were complemented by direct investment in spiritual rewards in the endowment of literally hundreds of chantries, hobbits, and religious fraternities, some of which enjoyed dedicated altars or chapels. There may well have been an element of competitive display here, as with the livery companies, in addition to genuine piety, but the end result was certainly an enhancement of London's physical appearance and its collective religious life. While we shouldn't be surprised by the vigor of late medieval religious devotion, it's worth noting that Londoners were able to sustain and enhance over a hundred parish churches, while less prosperous cities such as Winchester and York lost a significant number of their early medieval parish churches in the late medieval economic and demographic decline. Only one medieval London parish ceased to be viable and disappeared in the 15th century, and a couple more in the 16th. The majority of London's religious houses, as I've said, were established before 1300. And for the most part, pious patronage had turned away from the foundation of regular houses, but there were exceptions. Charter House and the Cistercian Abbey of St. Mary Graces by the Tower were both founded in the 14th century in the aftermath of the Black Death on sites used for burial during the pandemic. Charter House was founded by the courtier and soldier Sir Walter Manny and the Bishop of London, St. Mary Graces by Edward III. Both of them were well endowed. Charter House had a gross income of £736 and St. Mary Graces £602 in 1535-6. And both of them made a lasting mark on the London landscape, uh, especially the distinctive quadrangle of the Charter House. Another royal foundation was the new Hospital of the Savoy, founded by Henry VII in the early years of the 16th century. And these newer foundations complemented the array of monasteries, nunneries, friaries and hospitals established in London and its suburbs before 1300. Most of these were still reasonably sound in the early 16th century, and where they were not, this was often the result of maladministration as of inadequate endowments, as in the case of Holy Trinity Priory. Conventual churches and precinct buildings were repaired and developed, for example, St. Helens in the 15th century and St. Bartholomew's Priory in the, in the early 16th, while the popularity of the Greyfriars as a location for the burial of elite Londoners brought their contributions to its repair and ornamentation. On the whole, however, late medieval Londoners focused their beneficence on their parish churches or on works of practical piety, such as almshouses, hospitals, such as the 14th century Elsingspital, or on collegiate foundations. Hitherto, I've been referring to this map, using it to illustrate what I'm saying, as if it was a source for or confirmation of what I've been saying. But of course, the map itself is a construct. It's an artifact. It's not in itself a primary source. It's a means of communicating the knowledge and information that went into making it, but it doesn't in itself make new knowledge, though it can prompt new thinking and new insights. Looking at maps is always a rewarding pastime. As Keith Lilly explained in his talk in this series the other week, the Historic Towns Trust makes historical maps, reconstructions or interpretations of the past townscape, which are as good as the historical and cartographic expertise drawn on to produce them. I hope that means they're very good, but it's still important to understand how such a map is made and to be transparent about the sources and processes involved. The reader of a map needs to know how far he or she can rely on what it shows. So the map of London that we published in 2018 is in itself, is itself a revision of the reconstructed map of London published by the Trust in its third atlas volume in 1989. And the original itself determined some of the parameters of our map, most notably the date it depicts and the focus on the city omitting Westminster altogether. The 1989 map of London around 1520 differed from its predecessors in the Historic Towns Trust series, and indeed from our current practice, in being a thoroughgoing reconstruction map of a city at a specific date, 
not the superimposition of historical features on a redrawn historic map. Indeed, it represents the city of London some 30 to 40 years earlier than the earliest known picture map and some 150 years before the first surveyed plan form map of London. So it was something of a heroic undertaking. Its principal authors were the series editor, Mrs. Mary LaBelle, and the cartographer, Colonel Henry Johns, and his assistants at his mapping company, Lovell Johns, with considerable input from Caroline Barron and information from various contributors, including myself when I was then a graduate student. The undertaking benefited from the, ver from the plentiful documentation of property rights and holdings in medieval London and from the post-war archeological excavations that culminated in the establishment of the Museum of London's Department of Urban Archeology span in the 1970s. The street outlines of this map were based on the surveys of the city made immediately after the fire of 1666 and the locations and outlines of individual features were based on a wealth of information from historical and archeological research. If the 1989 map embodies a single vision, I think it's that of Colonel Johns, but there were certainly debates and discussions all the way. The Atlas comprised this large scale map of London around 1520, together with smaller scale maps showing London's parish and ward boundaries, as well as smaller scale maps of Roman London and London around 1270, plus chapters on London's historic development by Martin Biddle, Christopher Brook, and others. The Gazetteer, a vital feature of the whole, was compiled and edited by Victor Belcher with the assistance of Martha Carlin. And all of this is now, I should say, available for free on the Historic Towns Trust website. Obviously, not everything on the 1989 map was right. Once it was published, it was easy for readers with expert knowledge of specific features to point to errors of fact or differences of interpretation. And they were right to do so, since maps are plausible and persuasive and have a way of displacing the reality that they seek to interpret. So an object or a line on the map acquires a kind of authority that belies the tentative best guess intentions of its author. It's very hard to deconstruct the process of map making and disentangle the information and decisions that went into it. But even if it's imperfect, the 1989 map has, I think, but proved useful and interesting to a, range of, to a wide range of scholars, archeologists and other users, and it's still frequently cited and referred to. Now, the Atlas volume went out of print, or at least it's only available at a horrendous price in second hand. Um, it went out of print some time ago, and in 2008, Old House Books published for the Trust a single sheet stitched together version of the map at a slightly reduced scale with a shortened version of the Gazetteer printed on the reverse. And this is essentially the same map as in the Atlas of 1989 with the strengths and the weaknesses of the original, but in a handy format at an affordable price and it proved very popular. However, when the Old House Books map itself went out of print a few years ago, it seemed clear that we couldn't simply reprint a map nearly 30 years old, given the points we knew needed to be corrected, the advances in cartographic practice, and the additions to our knowledge of late medieval, early Tudor London, derived from three decades of archeological excavation and historical research. It was time to take on the challenge of revision, and this was undertaken by Caroline Barron again, the Trust's cartographic editor, Giles Darks, and myself, with invaluable contributions from Martha Carlin for Southwark and Nick Holder for the Friaries and Religious Houses, as well as input from several other scholars. Now, we've posted a discussion of the decisions and processes of revising the map on the Trust website, and I don't want to repeat all that now. But apart from the incorporation of corrections and updated information, I think the main points are the cartographic quality of the new map, which has been geo-rectified, so it fits on an ordnance survey base, and recolored for a more nuanced differentiation of the features shown, as you can see from this representation of the key. Also important is the extension of the area represented to include Southwark and Bishopsgate, and thus several more churches and religious houses. 
And also, I think very important, is the inclusion of parish boundaries on the face of the map. Anyone who works on London from the 13th to the 19th centuries knows that parishes were key markers of identity and belonging, as well as units of governance, and their boundaries were and still are significant. And we also revised the Gazetteer into a more succinct street directory keyed to the new map. So we do think that what we produced in 2018 is a better map in the sense of being more accurate and I think more beautiful than its predecessor, even though it could never have come into being without that foundation. It's since been complemented by a revision of the map of medieval London 1270 to 1300 from the Atlas volume to match the Tudor map in scale and appearance, and that was published in 2019. A very valuable aspect of the revision of both maps has been the potential to include them on the Layers of London website, for which georectification and rescaling were essential prerequisites. In digital form, the maps reach a wider audience and we willingly engage with individuals and projects who want to use either map or extracts from it from, for purposes of their own. Of course, even the new maps are in need of revision as knowledge grows and errors are identified. We issued a slightly revised version of the Tudor London map in 2020 and of the medieval London map in 2021, but we may have to plan for still further revisions in future. However, the early Tudor map uh, shows London around 1520. And as a historian with interests extending from the 13th to the 17th centuries, I'm very conscious that what we're looking at here is a medieval city on the eve of two transformative events, the Reformation and the ensuing dissolution of the monasteries and explosive population growth. The closure of the medieval monasteries, nunneries and friaries, featuring so prominently on this map, took place within a very short stretch of time between 1532, when Holy Trinity Priory at Oldgate was closed and its inmates dispersed, and 1540. In the interim, Charter House had been destroyed following the refusal of its community to accept the royal supremacy. The smaller houses had been shut down in 1535 to 6, and in 1538 to 40, the last remaining convents and friaries were surrendered. Not even all the hospitals survived. St Mary Bishopsgate and Elsingspittal went, while St Bartholomew's and St Thomas's had an uncertain few years before their re-endowment under Edward VI. The sites of the religious houses passed for the most part into private hands. Some of the conventual churches were repurposed as parish churches and their precincts became new parishes or liberties. Others disappeared almost entirely without trace or were transformed for new uses. So the Priory Church of Holy Trinity Oldgate was turned into housing and the precinct became the parish of St. James Duke's Place. The Church of St. Thomas of Acre became the Mercer's Company's chapel. The church and precinct of the Austin Friars was eventually given to the new Dutch community. The Grey Friars became Christ's Hospital. Many of the place names survived, but the physical form of the city was changed. And by the time the septuagenarian John Stowe published his Survey of London in 1598, the institutions themselves were barely a living memory. Even more wide ranging were the changes brought about by London's unprecedented population growth in the 16th and 17th centuries, which transformed a compact concentric city into a sprawling metropolis. The capital's population, which was perhaps 50 to 60,000 at the time of this map, swelled to 200,000 by 1600. Continued rapid growth in the 17th century brought it to perhaps 400, 450,000 by the time of the plague of 1665 and the fire of 1666. Population growth was partly accommodated by intensification of building within the walls, but mostly by the development of the suburbs and the colonization of green fields beyond the medieval city. So that as this uh, overlay shows, early modern London spread widely beyond its 1520 footprint. Now this growth and change are documented in maps and texts, the latter including of course John Stowe's survey and its later editions and continuations. 
Attempts to curb London's growth date from at least the 1580s, but they were unavailing. In 1611, John Speed wrote that, London, as it were, disdaining bondage, hath set herself on each side far without the walls, and left her west gate, by which he meant Ludgate, in the midst, from whence with continual buildings she hath continued her street to the king's palace, and joined a second city to herself. No walls are set about this city, and those of London left to show rather what it was than what it is. Thomas Freeman in 1614 wrote that London was in progress to Islington, and that St Catherine takes Wapping by the hand, Hoxton will to Highgate ere it be long. Planned developments like the laying out of Covent Garden in the 1630s are well known, but there was also much illegal and opportunistic building in the interstices as well as on the fringes of the metropolis in the form of alleys of poor housing and multi-occupied tenancies. Given these huge changes, there's a good case for seeking to produce a further map of London to embrace the new streets, buildings and features. Ideally, I think it would show London on the eve of the Great Fire of 1666. And I thank our cartographer Giles Darks for these mock-ups of an as yet to be made map. After the fire, there are new surveyed plan form maps, notably Ogilby and Morgan's map of 1676 and Morgan's map of 1682, which give an excellent impression of late restoration London. But obviously these depict a rebuilt city centre, as well as 10 to 15 years of further development on the fringes. So there are both challenges and opportunities here. It would certainly be feasible to bring our research skills and cartographic expertise together to close the gap between our historical map of 1520 and the post-fire historic maps. A map of London on the eve of the Great Fire could draw on the surveys of streets and plots carried out for the purposes of post-fire rebuilding and on the returns for the half tax of the 1660s, which name hundreds of streets, alleys and buildings. I'm sure it would have as great an appeal as the, as the Tudor London map, which has sold nearly 4,000 copies, maybe even greater given its much wider area coverage and its coincidence in time with figures such as Samuel Pepys and John Evelyn and the colourful life of Restoration London. But it would be a large and expensive undertaking and apart from cost, it does present logistical and te technical challenges. So a single sheet of the whole of pre-fire London at the scale of one to 2,500 would be the size of a tablecloth, far too unwieldy for a single folding map. But splitting it into two would raise further problems. Where should the division be drawn? And if it's presented as two sheets, how should the street directory be distributed? Is a folding map a feasible format at all for a city of this size? Another important question, should a new map of London on the eve of the Great Fire follow the cartographic style of the new medieval and Tudor London maps, which uh, uh, that's say large scale reconstruction, uh, which involves a lot of redrawing, or should it follow the Historic Towns Trust's more usual format of features overlaid on a grade down ordnance survey base? Likewise, while the Historic Towns Trust is committed to producing hard copy maps and atlases, we are also embracing the digital future. What digital formats and outputs should be part of such a project? The association with layers of London is obviously important, but there are other possibilities for digital distribution and dissemination. These are questions to which we don't as yet have all the answers, but we're certainly seeking to address them and to find a way forward. And if any generous potential patron of a new London map is watching this lecture, please don't hesitate to get in touch with us. Likewise, if you're from a different home city of which you think a historical map or atlas would be desirable and feasible, please do look at our website and the information about new projects and collaborations. Meanwhile, though, I hope you've enjoyed this exploration of early Tudor London and perhaps soon, once we're all able to travel again, you'll be able to walk the streets of the city, map in hand, and see how much of the late medieval streetscape you can recapture and envisage. Thank you. <laughs>